I think we'll get started. Um, thank you for joining us tonight. Uh, when we, we get together and started thinking about how to, um, or what we might put forward from LTU when it came to, the, to a webinar in terms of talking about teaching online. And we felt there were a lot of uh, important and necessary discussions that were occurring right at the beginning as everyone seemed to go remote. And they focused on the technology uh, and a lot of the tactics that were happening. We, we benefited from those conversations as well. Um, but I think given the, the time that's passed, the opportunity arose that we felt like we could talk about the culture of teaching um, and maybe to get into some deeper topics. I think some of the things that we'll share tonight have to do with um, maybe as much ambition as case studies in what we've been doing. And so we'd love to have a conversation that starts to point in future directions for things that are that's happening. Um, so a bit of introductions. My name is Carl Dobman. I'm the Dean of the College of Architecture and Design at Lawrence Technological University. And I'm joined by four panelists tonight. Um, Philip Plowright is a professor and as of August 1st is also the chair of the Art and Design program. Anurban Adya, oh, well, sorry, let me, so Anurban as well. Philip teaches our, um, well, we've all taught in the online Masters of Architecture program. Uh, and Philip has also recently started teaching our foundation design classes for every uh, discipline within the college, which includes architecture, graphic design, game design, industrial design, transportation design, and interiors. Um, and so Philip will bring that knowledge both from the Masters of Architecture program as well as the undergrad multidisciplinary foundation classes. Um, Anurban Nadia is joining us as well. Anurban's an associate professor and teaches in architectural design, urban design, uh, and teaches um, or coordinates the undergraduate studios that deal with site design, as well as um, ecological issues. Uh, Jason Yom is joining us. Jason's a former faculty member from LTU. Uh, he's now an assistant professor at ASU, and Jason taught um, both uh, design studios as well as courses in mechanical systems and building technology, um, both online and on ground, and we'll see some of the work from his students tonight. And Kristen Dean-Smith is joining us. Uh, she's a professor of practice and an adjunct faculty member, teaches uh, at in the early, in the first year, uh, visual representation courses, as well as in the graduate program online. Uh, and Kristen also practices and deals with um, practice and design build issues. Uh, so I think with that, you'll get a sense, we're gonna share some examples and case studies tonight from different aspects within the curriculum, both at the first year, as well as in the upper level graduate studios. Uh, and we're looking forward to having a discussion. We're also, uh, we pre-recorded what you're gonna see now so that we can also, if there are questions during the chat, we can be responding to those questions and then we also have time after um, the, the kind of structured formal portion of the presentation to take questions live as well. So we hope you enjoy this. We hope this generates a conversation. And I think with that, we'll uh, start the video. Thanks for joining us. We're going to talk about cultures of online teaching and learning. We put together this webinar because LTU has been offering online architectural education for over a decade. And while there's been so many discussions about different tactics and technologies, especially with the really quick switch to remote teaching, we thought it would be important to discuss culture, engagement, and interaction. We feel like these are things that we do both on campus and online, 
And we've given some specific thought about these things uh, as it relates to online education. Uh, there's benefits and there's constraints, like any system that we work with. Many of us are familiar with Moore's Law, where technology increases at an exponential rate. An important part of this that we're talking about both with education, but we also see it in industry related to disruption, is Martech's law. Organizations and cultures move at a logarithmic rate. And so what we have is a discrepancy between how fast technology moves and our ability as a culture or an, or, or an organization to respond to that technological change. And this is some of the issues that we want to address with the webinar. Many of these things are not new. When we're talking about online education, we inevitably come back to a discussion about what we're doing synchronously and what we can do asynchronously, locally and, distri and distributed. Uh, a couple of historic examples here. Uh, I think online education still suffers from the connotations that were created from correspondence school, completely asynchronous. Uh, what, we're, what we see now is an, a very rich, engaged learning environment that happens both synchronously and asynchronously. The other opportunities that we're also seeing have to do with uh, distributed collaboration. And this is also something in our profession that's been around for a while. This is an example on the right side of Albert Kahn's office building industrial buildings in Russia in, 19, in the 1930s. Uh, and just imagine the collaboration that had to occur where a question arose on site, something was photographed, and with, with an analog way, that photograph had to be processed, printed, and mailed back to the office in Detroit where it could be marked up and then it was sent back out to the site. And so our ability to collaborate now occurs instantaneously. Um, and while that's an opportunity, we're also gonna talk about maybe some of the pitfalls of that uh, instantaneous communication. And because of that global distribution um, or distributed network that we see within education, we probably often assume that people are distant. A lot of surveys and research is being done on online education, and a majority of students uh, opt for an online program that's, that's actually close to home within 50 miles of where they reside. Uh, we see there's a number of reasons for this. It's not really the, the specifics within the webinar, but I think that it gives us an opportunity to think about uh, with, when we invite those students to campus, that there may be opportunities for them, and then there are also ways to engage the students that may be uh, remote and very distant. Uh, so time zones are an issue when we're, when we're talking about synchronous education. And what we've tried to do today is we've looked at, uh, we've broken the webinar into three different overall approaches. And we, what we want to do in our first part is to talk about how we're hacking existing courses, uh, replicating what we do on ground, and what that might mean for online education. Uh, so what we see on the screen is just thinking through some of these different relationships, what we do in one type of space, how this might play out in a different model. The, the second part of the webinar, we're going to look at things that we're learning from teaching online, um, emerging opportunities that exist that maybe would not have come about if we were only looking at education on campus. And the third thing, because we want to talk about culture, are other types of things that occur with interactions, uh, things like peer-to-peer -peer collaborations and um, new opportunities that we're seeing in that area. And looking more broadly, and as a way to set up some of these things, we're looking at what's happening in the workplace. And so the workplace is evolving from a space that's just simply about utility or productivity, maybe from a kind of industrial revolution perspective, to thinking about how do you engage and attract the best talent, to now understanding the workplace as a place that is responsible for experience or what we'll be talking about tonight for culture. So we see these things relevant to education, probably aspects of recruiting, marketing, and how we create a culture both on campus and in our courses. 
So with this, I'll hand this over um, and we'll, we'll talk about existing courses and, and how we've kind of uh, developed those. Thank you, Carl. Um, we're going to take a look at how we start to think about how courses are structured and the elements within those courses and how those elements can be transferred through analogs into digital environment spaces. We'll look at various types of courses. Of course, the big one for us in design studios is this the nature of the studio itself, which has its own internal culture and is really, really critical for schools to maintain a type of experience for our, for our students. But if we really start to look at the idea of the studio, we realize the studio is not a homogeneous event. It is actually a whole series of events that are packaged within it, from desk crits to lectures to ad hoc discussions to peer-to-peer -peer interactions to the way students occupy a desk when faculty are not there, the type of environment that they create for themselves, the refrigerators, the hammocks hanging from the ceilings, all that is part of the creation of a culture, which we have to start to think about how do we and what do we transfer over into a digital environment, what parts are critical and which parts can drop away. And so we're gonna take through a few of these. The lectures are obviously the easiest. Uh, we do a lot of asynchronous lectures and we actually in studio spaces, we spend a lot of time documenting our knowledge within the studio. So we don't run studios so much as ad hoc and um, casual experiences with tacit knowledge transfer. We actually think about what are we trying to teach in the studio in this segment and how are we going to document that. Now there is an exception. We actually lecture differently depending on what year the student is at. We actually can't treat first year undergrad students the same as we can teach we can treat a graduate student. So in the first year experience, we actually do a lot of synchronous lectures. We get people into the same digital space, be it Zoom or some other, some other um, system for, for doing conferencing. And as we move into the graduate program, we actually move more towards asynchronous lecturing so that students then again take that information in at their own time on their own schedule. We also then think about the culture of the desk. And a lot of, a lot of um, the desk experience is quite easy to simulate through things like Miro or Miro or Sketchboard. These are persistent online environments. But what we found culturally is the desk is actually a, a blend between both a private space and a public space. And we actually have to start to think about where and how we simulate those two experiences. We'll often give a student a private space within, say, Miro where they have a space where they can put sketches, they can drop stuff, they can write notes to themselves. And at the same time, we'll, we'll simulate public spaces within rooms or other boards where it's more formal. We ask everybody to come in and, and put their work up there next to each other. And this is just a way that we start to think about how to both personalize and to take ownership over a virtual space in the same way that we would about a physical space. Um, another line is separating out the communication systems. And so when we start looking at what does it mean to have, say, persistent back channels, uh, we use, in this case, Discord or Slack uh, for us. There's lots of other ones that people can use, but some sort of um, IM or internet chat where the students can have a space to communicate with faculty. But also we found, um, and this was really interesting, the spaces of these chat channels got more useful for the students as authority moved out of them. So we'll often set up chat channels for the students and then the faculty and instructors will leave those channels so that there's no longer visibility for what goes on in those. Um, we found that those spaces are really critical for the students to build relationships with other students. A lot of, a lot of what we're finding in the online environments is, is we have to set up, in, we actually have to think very carefully as about setting up systems to combat things like isolation or this, this sense of separation. And so we will run multiple, multiple systems at the same time, multiple layers, to make sure that those students feel engaged. And then in the end, really what we're talking about when we're talking about these moves from analogs to digitals is really about information. And when we start, when we do, when we start uh, all of our design project, obviously we all started with this idea of research, the idea of gathering information in. When we no longer have local access to things, the question becomes, how do we then move that research to say remote systems? So considering field trip uh, as an essential experience uh, for students uh, in a class like a studio, uh, 
that very notion of local, which in a traditional uh, studio field trip is very centralized, faculty organized and coordinated, and each and every student in that on-campus studio participate at the same time and get a very singular experience of a very specific place based on where the site is. And the question becomes in an online environment, how do we replicate or how do we curate that experience of a local? Now with a distributed student in an online environment, the scope and uh, the possibility becomes from centralization to decentralization and isolation, where it's not just faculty, it's not faculty controlled, but it's student driven within the guidelines set by the faculty. So in this case, for example, it was a graduate studio, urban studio where a site and the local context was very important, but based on students' geography, whether the student is in um, Norfolk, Virginia, or Ann Arbor, Michigan, or Austin, Texas, uh, or in West Virginia, they went around about, selected a site in their locality uh, based on how they were approaching the world topic within the studio framework, and got a very specific individ individual a field trip experience. And then when these individual experience come back to the studio, it becomes uh, uh, those individual experiences, individual decentralized information uh, become uh, a basis, a broad basis for a shared collective knowledge. Again, students playing a pivotal role uh, in terms of bringing different discourses. Again, as an example, this was a, a project, a studio on urban ecology, urban wilderness, but different students based on their uh, input, their topic of interest looked into urban ecology through some through industrial vacancy, some through food production, some through fragmentation in human nature interaction. And ultimately as a studio, it was an enriching experience for all students through debates, interactions, and discussions, but also as a faculty to set up very specific framework for future assignments and uh, flow of the studio. So we can use the online environment for these kind of very special and specific localized experiences, but also then complement with uh, geopolitical tools, uh, technology, and data set that students can then access uh, in an online environment, whether it's a census, whether it's a certain photogrammetry uh, website and aerial imaging, or maybe coupled with a drone imaging at, the, at their locality if a student is interested in that. So for an urban or a landscape lab-based class, the integration of a very specific physical location based on the geography and then leveraging and harnessing the tools to then create a very specific tutorials of how to generate 2D and 3D drawing uh, from a local uh, aerial imagery or a local context and generating contours and modeling. Uh, so two things about that, one is that the students and their access to tools and technology and the data become important, but also a very step-by-step -step instruction, uh, some of which can be pre-recorded and pre-loaded, and some of which can be uh, um, curated based on student interest, uh, create again, a very specific individual topic-oriented and a rich flavor for individual students, but again, a shared environment of learning, and the culture of learning in the class. We can use these kind of hybrid uh, uh, interaction and teaching and learning options in urban landscape place-based workshop, but also it can be used for other classes, maybe not studio, uh, as we will see in some of the next slides, where we can use this lab-based modality uh, to leverage tools and different ways of interaction. At Lawrence Tech's uh, building system courses consists of two uh, parts. One is a lecture and then the other one is a lab. So through the lectures, uh, portions, students learn uh, fundamental principles of building systems and the knowledge behind those systems. 
and through on-ground setting, uh, on-ground lab setting, students uh, go through this hands-on experiences. So what you see on the slide is that uh, one assignment, in the one assignment, students uh, design their shading systems and then they actually built it in a full scale. And then by using some sensors, they actually measure the lighting intensity and then how their shading system works in the actual environment. And the on the right part is the testing uh, is the how to how each individual perceive thermal environment differently. So some students tested their uh, wind different wind speed, and then some tested their uh, different uh, skin temperature by using some thermographic camera. And then when it comes to the online setting, uh, it became a very challenge how to keep and maintain this hands-on experiences and then convert it into the on, um, online setting. So the way I designed it is that I used just, just simple technologies and applications. You can find it and download it in the application uh, through the smartphone. So what you see on the left part is the application uh, which you can measure the uh, like a sound uh, intensity, the decibel, noise level, and then what you see on the right part is the lighting intensity, of the result. So through the assignment, student actually running around their houses and then measure the noise level, and then student go to the bathroom and bedroom and then measure the lighting intensity, and then compare it with their standard or the lighting guidelines or some uh, some building code, so that they can still have these ha uh, hands-on experiences through uh, the online lab session. And also for the big term team project, and then students uh, pick up their own houses, and then because they're living inside their house, they just goes to their HVAC system, and then they measure the light, lighting intensity. And then they uh, presented their renovation project, and then they verified its performance improvement by using some simulation programs so that through this whole process, uh, the lecture is pretty much the same, but in the online setting through this process and by using some simple technologies, we can still maintain this hands-on experiences through this uh, various assignment. So we can also consider ways in which we strategize visual communication differently in an online environment. Um, at the onset of work, it often becomes about managing source content where a Google image search might return a variety of questionable results. Um, it becomes critical to direct students towards higher quality sources, um, archives, or higher quality precedent, which in turn produces a higher quality understanding and therefore higher quality work, as well as developing literacy in research methods and, and documentation. We also, um, we also need to realize that digital outputs can be opportunities, but teachers and students both have to understand the inherent differences of presentation methods and use them appropriately. So traditional static composed presentation boards don't translate well to online formats when you're zooming in and out and moving around a, a board. Um, whereas a linear slide-based presentation, a kind of one, one slide model, becomes far more legible in the online but that legibility then is a result of consistent layout and alignment. So different, dif some different graphic standards apply when transitioning from uh, a kind of presentation board to a slide-based board presentation. The, did the digital studio also provides opportunities for dynamic outputs which might not find their way or place into a, a physical studio. And so opportunities for animated videos or GIFs that work in some ways uh, better than static outputs in the digital studio um, are available. And the studio work then becomes a simultaneous presence of many different uh, types of outputs, both static and dynamic. We can also think about the role of physical model making in the online studio, which can exist, and how it presents an opportunity uh, where the documentation of the model itself can be a place for analysis. Um, typical archival documentation of a model, like, like on the left, doesn't have the same implications as documentations in, documentation when it happens in service of the production of a curated digital asset. So in this case on the right, 
uh, visual communication students build a narrative about domestic life as it relates to Mar Marcel Boyer's Niffen House through um, specific curated digital photography of their models. We can also consider the, the, this role of physical model making in a hybrid way. And so hybridizing physical model making and digital presentations provide opportunities, different, different and unique opportunities for iteration, for presentation, and for analysis. Um, we've talked about how, how mitigating isolation of the online studio is really important. And one of the ways that we can also do that is through outward facing dissemination of work. In particular, that, that, uh, that which is also able to receive feedback, such as competitions or blogs or even social media, can become ways to broaden the, the, the studio interactions of the students with a larger audience. We've also utilized the production of books, which serves as a method of documentation, a way to disseminate work, but also as an analytical tool, as a way to craft an, a particular narrative around the work itself. So this wrap up this first section, one of the things that we consider when we, when we think about our courses is that we no longer see them as, as a single piece, but we start to pull all those pieces apart and start to then understand strategies that we can re-engage them. Where this dissemination in place is in some ways very easy because it's very natural. Somebody's in front of you, you can easily have a conversation. But as we move from dissemination in place to a more network approach, we actually have to be much more careful about the information that we're putting out and how we engage other communication in networks is actually much more difficult to do. And it's much more difficult to keep students engaged as, as we move into digital environments. We'll move on to the next section as we're going to start looking at what we've learned from digital environments and how we bring those, that, those learning back into, um, into other strategies. Thank you, Philip. Um, so in the first section, uh, we really looked into um, maintaining the culture of uh, on-ground classroom and culture of a lot of the spontaneity and uh, interactivity and looking at different strategies to um, replicate or calibrate in a digital environment. Uh, this section will focus really on um, uh, strategies using which we can leverage uh, the online education specifically uh, in its own terms and how we can then build on that to develop certain um, information, new information, tools, and strategies, um, which we have found in Lawrence Tech that comes with immense possibilities, but also uh, it needs very careful uh, consideration, planning, curation, and nurturing. So any education, uh, uh, specifically online education, uh, a lot depends on uh, teachers and good online education depends on good teachers in terms of individuals, uh, their preparation, uh, their passion, dedication, uh, and uh, personalities. But beyond that, good education depends on good teaching where the department, collection of the faculty, the school of thought, the college uh, come into picture where certain support systems from one another uh, bear important implications for developing that culture of teaching. And finally, uh, even going beyond just individual teachers and the teaching for uh, looking at the institution where administration, infrastructural support, but more importantly, students. Uh, and so when we are thinking about culture and uh, curating that culture in an online environment, we need to think about these different course management strategies using which we can support individuals but we can also maintain and curate and organize a consistent, meaningful experience uh, of teaching by the faculty uh, and also very consistent, meaningful experience of learning uh, uh, from the students. So toward this good teaching and learning, we have found that there are three elements which are key uh, and critical um, for that meaningful experience. Uh, one, preparation. Uh, very um, 
careful consideration and planning of uh, orientation of course materials or uh, navigation uh, of uh, different materials of a course through learning management systems organization through uh, precise strategic and intentional documentation which then become a foundational platform for engagement and when we talk about engagement we need to think about diversity diversity of faculty interests and background and expertise diversity in terms of student location uh, their geography their time zones their time their context and their environment uh, what kind of technological access they have their demographics so there needs to be a lot of thinking in terms of how we are designing very specific course management strategies and tactics in terms of syllabus layouts assignments layout how do we post lectures is it reading based is it audio based is it video based how do we record do we pre-record uh, or do live record how do we hold office hours for different students and then that has implication, all these have implication on performance evaluations of grading and then discussions and overall conversations uh, of content, but also culture in, in classrooms and in general uh, in, in the department and the college. So in the next few slides, I hope to provide you for uh, uh, some examples of these different sets of course management strategies. So one looking into documentation where we can use, uh, Philip talked about workspace as desks in virtual environment, but we can also look at the workspace, virtual workspace like Mural in this case, as an evolving archive, uh, a documentation of each and every session of the class or each and every second of that class, whether it's a class introduction uh, to certain reviews and crits, if it's a recording of a synchronous session where everybody was there in the class versus small group discussions and office hours. So this becomes an open, transparent, uh, accessible resource for students and faculty, uh, individually and in teams or as a large group to look back and trace how we evolved through this process of learning from project one to project two to project three but also look at important checkpoints of deadlines and critique, uh, critical feedback through different uh, internal and external evaluation. So this become again, uh, not just a working space, but also a shared learning space. Uh, similarly, moving on, we can look at learning management systems, whether it's Canvas, Blackboard, or Loop, or you're using uh, Google uh, teaching classrooms. Uh, here again, the organization of a course page, course homepage, become a site for information and it also become, uh, becomes a, an evolving living document where we can start to see that the website, a course page, uh, is not just the learning management system, is not just about faculty input and the one-way communication, but certain outputs at different stages, whether it's static, whether it's dynamic, as Kristen pointed out, in terms of project outcomes, can be curated, can be presented, and could become important points of discussion and feedback for students themselves. So students can start to see how, depending on where and when they are in, in the point of the course, how their outcomes is, how their outcomes are influencing future discussions and future assignments. Other examples we have to consider uh, at this uh, uh, day and age of different tools, different devices, and different points of access for students. Uh, multiple devices, multiple file formats, and multiple layouts. So we are working with image, uh, we are working with static and dynamic images, we're working with audios and videos, and how to organize them, how to interconnect them. Uh, sometimes students prefer a more tabular uh, image-based layout. Uh, for example, my graduate students ask for more freedom that they can look at old uh, assignments or old discussions. Sometimes in case of, depending on if, if the students are more uh, undergraduate, freshmen, they prefer more task-based kind of, they can just scroll, scroll through step-by-step, -step, week one, week two, week three, or even smaller tasks within each week. A lot of students 
access these files as they are driving and listening. So do audio files become important as well as kind of parallelly uh, uh, as we are providing them videos? A lot of them access through their mobile phones. So we need to, in terms of preparing and planning these uh, course organization, orientation and navigation of materials, we need to think that how these materials will be accessed, how they are becoming visible uh, uh, by students across these different formats, different platforms and uh, different devices. Um, on the back end for faculty, the learning management systems, its connection to certain facilities like YouTube uh, studios, uh, could become important tool and uh, critical feedback for us to look at which videos are being more accessed, which ones are more popular in terms of students' access. Even there are possibilities to look at even within each video, certain time segments which are more popular or certain time segments where we get the student attention drop, uh, drop off. And why it's happening? Is it something how we are presenting information are there other audiovisual information that enhances that? And we can learn from that and tweak and refine the next material or our next posting. So along with the preparation and planning uh, to enhance the shared learning experience and culture in classroom, uh, in Lawrence Tech, we believe that each opportunity of engagement in a class, in an online class, is a moment of conversation with students. And that can be done in a canvas, for example, through discussion when we are introducing ourselves. So we are asking students to introduce themselves. So audio and video start to play an important role in that beyond just text-based writing and posting. Uh, it play an important role in our lectures where we can bring in not just our voice as kind of internal uh, faculty, but all, also externals. We have found uh, many cases where we are uh, working with very specific tools, uh, whether it's a GIS or a Rhino or SketchUp, uh, where we are building models to bring in maybe some other students or graduate students in an undergraduate class as an expert, where students start to see um, kind of different roles of students advanced in the program and also can benefit from that different those different voices and different points of view, uh, whether again, through a very topical lecture or a tool-based uh, workshop or simple discussion about or debates about introductions or certain materials. Uh, so we can use uh, these kind of managements even while we are uh, generating and uh, designing assignments. Uh, so in studios, in Traditional studios, oftentimes we work with larger assignments, larger projects. In online environments, we have found that very specific task-based, smaller deadlines, micro deadlines work even within a week, uh, kind of task for um, certain groups of days, uh, tasks based on individuals or uh, groups of individuals, where it becomes kind of a regular checkpoints for them to be on track. Uh, and see how their project is evolving and then immediately getting uh, quick feedback. So even a large project can be designed and set up as series of sequences of very specific curated and planned uh, projects and operations with very contained outcomes. Um, it also sets up uh, very specific uh, uh, expectations uh, uh, in terms of flexibility. Uh, and in terms of teamwork. So we can have asynchronous content where students individually or in small teams can access, uh, which where the audio video pre-recording become important. Uh, teamwork, small groups become uh, crucial more so than individual interactions in terms of interaction with faculty, so student-faculty communication, where we are not just interacting, but we are, we are also learning as an individual from faculty's interaction and communication with another student. Uh, so we have moved more from one-on-one -on -one crits to small group crits, uh, where this co-presence and co-awareness in the same environment and the online uh, platforms allow that. Uh, so we have seen that when we are having Zoom sessions with this one group kind of in the back chat room is quite uh, rolling and 
feedback and discussions among other groups uh, based on some of the feedback. So it opens up uh, how we do, how we set up this teamwork uh, um, through these parallel but dedicated communication channels, uh, Zoom chat room, Slack, Discord, Canvas discussions directly, uh, a culture of different ways and networks of communication uh, building on uh, these different ways of uh, accessing information. So that these diverse ways of interaction also plays important role when we are looking at uh, diversity in terms of time zones. Uh, Carl talked about our student population um, focused on Michigan and the Midwest, but also uh, nationally through different uh, geography of the United States, but also internationally. Uh, and it has two things. One, it, it provides flexibility um, for faculty or students uh, to travel. Well, uh, under current context, when uh, we will be able to travel. Uh, but on the other hand, uh, on the flip side, it also brings begs the question about expectations of how we communicate and this demand and expectation of always being on call. Uh, this 24-7 environment of kind of persistent and almost pervasive uh, um, online experience uh, almost taking over uh, our life. Um, so personally, I'm, I always, when I'm teaching an online class, uh, there is always this anxiety of, are my students waiting for me in Zoom? Am I late for posting something? So this becomes an important discussion point among faculty and we, have, we are still learning. We, we are continuing to discuss different options of how do we manage and curate that culture of expectations? How do we set up boundaries? How do we, in terms of communication with students through email, through text, through other IMs? Uh, Philip talked about dedicated communications, com communication channels and it's, how it's very important to set it up but then step out of that. And that requires certain boundary and protocol that we understand as faculty, but also students understand. So that become a very uh, fundamental and foundational element of uh, culturally, very foundational and uh, critical in terms of setting up different interaction opportunities and enhance peer-to-peer uh, -peer learning and interaction point among students, which we believe is a central aspect of uh, enhancing uh, the culture of online delivery. To, so to wrap up this second session on looking into online experiences of teaching and learning and what we can extract from that, it comes down to calibrating and adjusting our expectation, expecting that we will need more planning and preparation time as individuals, but also discussing that with administrations and institutions in terms of support infrastructure and time. Um, expectation of more strategic and vivid organization in terms of documentation and learning management systems. But ultimately changes in expectation, adjusting our expectation of students and the diverse context they find themselves as they're working from home, uh, as they're working and juggling different uh, responsibilities of work, of school, of family. And the online environment provides that platform to discuss that cultural aspect, which we will take, take on in the third segment as we move on uh, to look at how we can now not just replicate and not just curate, but expand on and extend that culture towards student interaction and shared peer-to-peer -peer learning. And so as with all learning environments, peer-to-peer -peer learning is as important as the instructor to student learning. And in the online environment, perhaps more so because it can be a way to create a more robust studio culture but how that's implemented might be different in the online environment from traditional formats. And we found success when we take cues from design practice. And so 
where peer-to-peer -peer learning might occur naturally in synchronous real space, studio culture and peer exchange in online environments often has to be more explicitly organized uh, by the instructor. And so we looked for ways, we looked for ways to curate specific expertise through the work, which asks students to specialize in a depth of information rather than overlapping broad general information by all students. And then, and then these, these, this, the specialized knowledge begins to be shared back to, uh, to groups or peers. Um, and so we've, one method that we've used to structure peer-to-peer -peer learning in online scenarios is group work or team-based learning. And often the concern with group work in the online environment is individual student availability. Online students tend to have a wider variation in personal schedules, are sometimes, as we've talked about, located across different time zones. And this potential barrier to the success of the work uh, can discourage its implementation. Um, certainly, asynchronous collaborative workspaces such as Mural. Um, and file sharing platforms like Drive and Dropbox can become a place where all types of work and idea can be exchanged. And these tools definitely help to mitigate those scheduling differences and create a strong asynchronous learning space. But to, to be effective, peer-to-peer -peer learning work also really needs to be more rigorously structured to ex more explicitly drive the exchange of ideas between peers. We found it helpful to start work with a self, start group work with a self-assessment survey, which helps both the instructor and the students understand the range of skills and tools and even personalities of the class. And so we can use these as a tool to begin to inform how we, how we, how we make groups and structure groups, as well as begin to assign leadership roles, specific tasks based on proficiencies such as software, or even different areas of personal interest or expertise. In hybrid scenarios, which many schools are adopting this semester, finding ways to leverage local and remote students to achieve different research tasks can be helpful. So online members within a group uh, can take on digital-based research such as precedent, uh, while an on-ground members can take, uh, take site measurements and specific site observations. And then that knowledge is then shared back to their, to their whole group, which allows teams to build a collective understanding through individual work. Another strategy is to, in the context of research or analysis assignment, is to create specialized research teams across the studio, where each group becomes experts in a specific area of knowledge through directed research. And then this research is then compiled as a shared analysis, analysis which is available to everyone in the class. In this case, um, a research assignment for AFS3. The process was aided through a shared template and some graphic standards so that research had legibility across the work. And there was an all team coordinator who oversaw the work outputs and the transfer of information between groups. That and other specialized research which precluded the, the student's final assignment in AFS3 in which that previous specialized research was leveraged as teams were then remixed into their final groups so that each of the final project teams had one to two experts from each of the topics investigated in previous assignments. Setting up this team organization in early assignments can translate to students carrying through that organization in later assignments, even if it's not imposed by them by instructors. So an example from critical practice this year, 56 students organized themselves into specialized teams, both online and on ground. Each team had different tasks, but working towards a common objective and project. And so in this way, the work of the studio can begin to more closely reflect the organization of design practice. The Q&A session is a very important moment that you can provide some proper feedbacks on students' work and then also increase this uh, interaction between the students. But when it comes to the moment of do you have any questions, but usually we often get uh, awkward silence and then always handful students always the same and then they ask a question.
So two of all, and then this tendency became an uh, increase in the online setting because you're behind the screen is too high. So to avoid those uh, tendency and then to maximize the benefit of uh, having an online session, I try some different strategies for the students' uh, feedback and then a uh, Q&A session. So what I ask for the midterm uh, assignment, I ask them instead of having a live uh, teamwork presentation, I ask them to record their presentation and then uh, share it with me so that I can share it with everybody. So what you see on the screen is just a couple of examples of a student's presentation. I actually got a couple of uh, benefits out of it. The first thing is that the student's presentation got much better because they re uh, recorded it and then watched it and then they couldn't uh, tolerate it. So they redid their work. So presentation skills increased significantly. And then also the through this process, and uh, if you go to the next slide, then students actually left a comment and Q&A session. And specifically in here, a lot of actually shy, usually quiet students, they actually start to, to speak out loud and then leave some comment. And then a couple of uh, really nice questions became a discussion, long discussion thread. Usually that doesn't happen that often in the on-ground setting. So I think it's a benefit of having an online session and having this record. You're always accessible and then you can leave a comment without just judging, uh, without worrying about just by somebody. So I think this is a really good benefit that by having an online session. Then also, uh, when you uh, give a students a team-based work, there's always this uh, so-called freeloader student who doesn't do that much of contribution and then still they get the points or grade based on their teamwork. And then again, this tendency became, uh, uh, this tendency increased during in the online session. So to avoid those things, we uh, use this peer-to-peer -peer assessment. So basically every, after every single assignment, I send out this quiz format uh, type of assessment thing to every single student. And then they provide their team member's name and then they assess their team member's contribution and then the time management and all that. So if you go to the next slide, this is the result of two drastic differences. The left one is a good students where most majority of their teammates responded, uh, contributed equally, academic contents equally, and a very strongly agree. So if I see the result on the left graph, uh, then I don't have any problem with the student. But if you see the right graph, which you can see that uh, majority of this of uh, his or her teammates strongly disagreed about the contribution, then I sometimes I engage directly one-on-one, uh, -on -one, I send them an email, and then if this conti happens continuously, then I actually uh, deduct their grade and then give them an official warning. And then also I use it as a, like a positive way. So if one student continuously get a compliment by their uh, teammates, then I bump up their grade so that it works in a both way. And then through this process, they are always aware of that their teammates are working together so that it obviously increased the, uh, like a student interaction throughout the process. So that concludes the formal portion of uh, the webinar and some of the key ideas that we wanted to share. I think there's both a reflection on our part as well as an aspiration to be uh, continually improving the way that we think about the culture and the way that we teach. Uh, we'd love to be able to engage people either through the chat or through uh, real-time questions now. So uh, let us know what your questions are and we'd be happy to engage you. I don't know if people were able to follow the chat as that was going, but there was a number of conversations that were happening that I think would be great to, to pick up on this. Um, I think, Anurban, you had one that you wanted to talk about the 24-7 environment, and then I know that uh, there was a lot about baking. So why don't we deal, why don't we start at the bottom of the chat list, although there's more things coming in now. The other thing I would say that there were some people Talking about this format, um, I think it ran smoothly, but I don't think the panelists were prepared to have to listen to themselves, which 
wasn't an enjoyable aspect to this, but uh, that's the only warning that I would give. So Anurban, why don't you introduce the 24 seven question and maybe unpack that a little bit. Yeah, sure. Uh, I think uh, Adam Fingret uh, brought that uh, question about that in uh, physical uh, studio spaces, uh, it's a 24 seven environment. Students are always there, they're working together um, and that becomes a motivation and inspiration to work harder, work more, uh, produce and also engage and creates those uh, obviously spontaneous opportunities of learning and communication and how do we engage that experience in an online studio. Uh, I think it's a critical issue, we are still learning. Uh, I think we tried to address some of the questions about multiple ways of breaking down the isolation uh, that working on your own in uh, an online environment uh, leads to. A uh, couple of things I can talk about. One is uh, really providing consistent and constantly available uh, work workspace, whether it's through mural or through uh, Canvas that students can always go to and see the work developing and adapting and evolving. Uh, a lot of faculty have experimented with uh, kind of a dedicated and persistent Zoom room where either students show up or some faculty in a distributed way are there at different times uh, of the day. Uh, I think uh, though also a little bit of an underrated thing is uh, to talk about or uh, use the peer-to-peer -peer, uh, channels and peer-to-peer uh, -peer learning uh, as a strategy to break down the isolation. And I think online provides us with, online mechanisms and tools provide us with some of those opportunities more, uh, whether it's Slack or Discord, where students can see the work developing, but also can talk about that. Uh, I think uh, Philip, Jason, Kristen can jump in. Go on. No, I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a serious issue and, um, you know, it's one that we're that we're constantly working on. It's there was a question on the on the chat side that's also asking for failures, and um, I have a spectacular Slack failure, and and it comes. It's a really interesting thing when you introduce new people into an environment that's working really well, and the environment dies, and so that's um, that's also what we've learned from it as well. But at the same time, we also we just we're really really lucky to have a game design program, which most of the stuff is native to them, and we're we're exporting things that we've learned from game design into architecture and into interiors, uh, and urban, and so uh, the disc Discord as a persistent space seems to work in a lot of ways better than Slack. But it's really about encouraging culture, and that's what it comes down to: um, creating a space where the students actually get to know each other. It's not always monitored. It's not a space where there's an authority in it. Those things are those and that's, you know, the memories we have of studios are two o'clock in the morning, right? And pitch black and there's, there's five of you in there hitting a deadline, you know, but there's also a moment where I think we have to actually step back and, and talk about maybe moments in our culture, which are not positive, that are abusive, that are, do create health issues for our students. And you know, whether we actually want a student in a space for 48 hours straight without food or sleep, which, you know, I think this is a, an amazing point in our history to be able to really look at that and, and talk about what we want to hold on to and what maybe we want to let go of. So there was a question that came up um, from Will Wittig, actually, you know, the point that we do all these things online and we expect people from all over and Will is just down the street in Detroit as well. Um, but we're actually realizing that one of the things that we're going to be facing in the fall is students, well, we're, as LTU, our undergrad at least, is gonna be on ground, but we also know that there are gonna be students that can't attend. And a question came up about how you deal with students that are remote and stu students that are physically in the space. And I think we do have, uh, Kristen and I co-taught a class this summer. I know Philip has had examples. And maybe I'll also just pull in one other question that was, um, in terms of the remoteness, I'd say that we do allow our online students to come to campus. While not all of them are close enough to do that, they're welcome on campus. So we have hot desks that are available, they can use the shop, they can use resources, and those types of things can happen. And so um, the online students are not excluded from campus, it's just the online format gives them a flexibility and a freedom to be working or doing other things. 
Um, but I think if we took up what feels like a really timely topic, like how to deal with students that might be in the classroom and students that are remote. Um, and I think in, Kristen can share the example. We also had a faculty member that we had three, three faculty local and one that was in Italy. Um, and so how to teach with colleagues that way and how to teach students in that environment. You wanna talk about it, Kristen? Is this too uh, soon? <laughs> no. <laughs> Sorry, I thought, I thought you were gonna talk about it. Um, yeah, I mean, one of the things that we've, we've found, and, and it really was quite the experiment that we, that we took on for critical practice this, this summer, um, the students convene at the end of, so the, the course is taught fully online for the first nine weeks, and then the students convene uh, on campus, traditionally convene on campus for a one week build session. And this, this year, students, some students opted out from, uh, from, from that session. And so we had a group of students that was working online and a group of students that was working on ground together. And the biggest issues were finding ways to interface the, the, on, the online students and the on-ground on students and keeping that communication open. Um, the, the first thing that we discovered is that whenever you're simultaneously meeting or, or synchronously meeting with students online and on ground at the same time, that everyone has to be interfacing through a device. Whether, whether you're standing two feet away from someone, if, if anyone else is joining remotely, everyone has to have headphones in and be talking into a device because immediately any conversation that happens, even just by turning your head to the person sitting next to you, is immediately lost on the online uh, on, on the online cohort. And so it immediately isolates and alienates them from any interaction. And so that becomes a, a, a really important equalizer. But the other thing that we found is it, it was those asynchronous channels that the students were interacting. So that was, on a, you know, that was on a formal level by faculty, but it was the asynchronous channels that, um, that really helped the students interface with, between the on-ground cohort cohort and the online cohort. And they all set up, you know, it was, it was group work. And as I, I mentioned in that slide, each, there, was, there was a number of different teams that were set up. Each of those teams online had a different room that they were working in. And anyone could check into that room and know where to find them. There was a, there was a kind of way that students let each other know where they, where they were. There was a Slack channel that let, let students know if they had questions for each other. There was a separate Slack channel that let them know if they had questions for us. So we were running multiple ways of, of, of seeing and interacting with the studio simultaneously that sought to engage the online, uh, the online cohort as much as, as much as possible. The one thing that's like so fascinating to me right now too is that for the longest time, this seemed insane. And now the reality is that most design offices, this is exactly how they're working as well. And so our students, it, it's funny, our students would be working in an office and saying, oh, they're doing their degree online. Now they've become the central person to help their offices understand how to navigate this way. Um, so just all of those different communication channels that you were talking about, Kristen, have been so, so both, you know, frustrating at moments, like trying to find a stu student, which Zoom room are they in? I think we had like six simultaneous Zoom rooms at any one time. Um, but And the other thing ahead. that I would say is that it seems, you know, while I, I find it in intimidating and it, depend it depends to a certain extent on the age of the students, but the students are very used to being connected through their devices to each other. That's part of their, that's part of their culture currently uh, uh, outside of studio. And so that's not, a, that's not a foreign thing to them, even though I think for a lot of us, it seems, it seems quite odd. Well, and I know that Philip, like you talked a little bit about using phones as your device, possibly even having an assignment in the first year foundation studio that the students could actually draw a drawing on their phone. And they look at slides on yeah. their phone. And you even talked about your own slides being bold and graphic enough that they could be readable on a phone. Well, it's a lot to do with scale. And then we move into, we do a lot with animated GIFs as well and other, and other really, um, really fast and low res technologies. 
and, and for the students, they wanted, you know, it's a bit of a laugh because in a lot of our syllabi, there's a line in there that bans all mobile devices. And in our syllabi, it's if, if you don't bring your phone, you shouldn't come to class. It's, it's an active tool. I don't know why we're not using it. And so uh, in this semester, I mean, we're going to be running a, a hybrid. Um, and I'd say like it's a hybrid class. It's on ground, but it's really an online class that has on ground components to it because that's the only way with 125 students is the only way we're going to be able to handle that. And the phone, the phone and the, and the iPad and, and the surface are all going to be critical tools and going to be our main interface. And so for us, it may be, it's a little bit difficult for the students we have coming in. They're all digital natives um, and they're not even, they're not, but they don't understand resolution, but they understand, they understand um, social media and it's, it's native for them. Yeah, I think there was one question about uh, device and also uh, different internet capacity or connectivity uh, among students. I think that's a larger infrastructural issue. Uh, but also I think in uh, Lawrence Tech, we were lucky that all undergraduate students get uh, the laptop with uh, specific images and that definitely has helped the students. I mean, there are uh, expectations and uh, of certain internet capacity to use audio, video, and multimedia. But also in many cases, I mean, in some cases, uh, if some students drop out of, due to connection, they can come back and that's where the recordings help uh, recording the sessions or the crits. Or sometimes as a faculty, you have to set up a one-on-one -on -one or a small group session to go over. Uh, just to address a couple of those questions that came up. Can we, how about we come back to that aspect of making? I know that Jason has dealt with it in a couple of different ways in, in his classes and some of the technical classes. And then I think um, we also see it in the studios to some extent, um, probably more so talking about at the graduate level when we're talking about online. You guys want to pull back or, or maybe introduce some of the questions that are, are probably somewhere in the middle of the chat right now? There's also a latest question about how are students encouraged to develop haptic sensitivities and skills. And that's not just making, but kind of definitely connected to that. So in my case, uh, during the on-ground sessions, students were like requested to make a full size, full scale model, but obviously they can do it at their place. So instead I asked them to uh, use your house and the use your own physical space to measure like the sensitivity so that they sometimes measure their thermal sensation through their own inside their room. And then they check their lighting intensity with their phone application uh, for their living room. So those type of things, it's not ideal, but still it gives you the haptic uh, like uh, experiences through the uh, through the lab session, so I think it definitely helps for the students to understand how this this environment works in terms of the building uh, systems, and then still they can have those experiences. And then also, uh, yeah, I think that's it. And I think. Uh um, I mean, I feel like physical making should still be encouraged. I mean, and this is something that where I think we're still working out. We're talking about that in the visual communication sequence this, this semester. Um, you know, even in the absence of a 3D printer or a laser cutter, right, students can still make things. And we've talked about kind of giving them a list of kits of things that they could order on Amazon, linking to YouTube videos about how to be more effective or, or how to, how to learn craft, you know, practice, practicing your, your knife skills and your gluing and all of those things that can all, that can all be part of the, of, of the culture. Um, we've also talked about ways in which, you know, we're, we're thinking about a hybrid model this semester where some students are online and some students are on ground. And this is where group work again can play a huge part in, in that learning, you know, a student who's online could still be responsible for setting up the laser cutter file, even if the person on ground is the one who administers the cutting. And so that can, that, that doesn't have to be a sing, an, an activity executed by a single person, but people can take place in the production of a digital model 
um, that translates into a, a physical model as, as well. Um, and I, this is a conversation that we've talked about a lot of, that, that studios and, and practices are doing that over the globe. They're not necessarily all printing models and things in shop, in house. And so the students can start to think about how to kind of outsource their own fabrication in, in some capacity. Um, but then I would also emphasize that, that then how we, how we show each other those things that we've made, that's the thing that's, that's different. And, and so the documentation of the model, um, which again, uh, as, as mentioned, can be an analytical tool, can be part of the, of the representation process of the design process, um, becomes becomes a critical a critical thing. It's not just making the thing and setting it on your desk. Now you have to now you have to figure out how to represent that uh, over over again to communicate that in another way. The the thing I would add too, as I see some of the questions coming through the chat, um, I think of the the four of you, one thing is kind of clear and maybe it's a culture within our school maybe it's because we've i think it, someone responded in the chat that everyone has taught online and so the transition has been easy but even to maybe zoom out a little bit and say all of the things that we're talking about the faculty view these as maybe productive constraints or opportunities and so it's like is it this software or that software? Is it 24 seven? What about models? How do we make these things? I think like what I, you know, in, in, in our preparation for this webinar and in the creation of this webinar, I heard each of you at various moments kind of step back and say like, okay, that's a constraint. How do I work around that? How do I think about technology to do these things? And maybe it brings us back to that aspect of the kind of the topic, which is the culture. And I think in some ways among the faculty, I'd say there's a there's a consistency in that kind of willingness to do these things. We're not we're not driven by fear. Oh my God, we're not going to have models. What's going to happen? It's like like Kristen just said, like oh, we can outsource it, or how does someone collaborate, or what occurs with that? What are the the repercussions of those things? Um, and I've I've heard each of you guys talk about that in different ways. And like you're you're approaching the studio or your class and the culture in the class as a design exercise. And is that is that a fair thing or do each of you guys want to talk about that because maybe we can't answer every specific question but i think you're you all seem to be operating from a position where you're you're engaging and taking these issues on as opposed to like even the example you said philip like rather than saying no more cell phones in the class it's like please bring your cell phone right and the way that that changes something yeah well, I mean, the, the issue with moving to online and the issue that I think it creates for all design disciplines is that the online environment doesn't handle tacit knowledge transfer well. And so when we're working in disciplines that have evolved out of historical legacies with master apprentice um, transfers, where it's like, I'm going to show you something and then you just do what I do and then you'll learn over multiple years what that might be but it's it's all none of it's explicit the online the digital environment doesn't handle that and so what it forces you to do as an instructor is to think about how to encapsulate your knowledge and I was thinking about while Kirsten was talking about the model and I was thinking about some of the things we've you know there was a point when we pulled we pulled physical models away we really moved away from physical models and then we re-injected them back in because we lost too much quality in, in a few studios where we started to realize it was really about what the student was learning and how they were understanding space. But when you have somebody make a model and you're in this environment, you really have to think about the value of that because you're actually making them, it's, it's quite complicated and you're making them, you know, they have to find resources, they have to get this, they have to open a space up. It's, it's not as casual as when you have a culture in a school where you provide an environment that reinforces that. And when they're solo, they're always going to ask you, they're going to challenge you. It's like, why do I have to do this? Like, this is a lot of work, blah, blah, blah. You're like, and you have to be really, you really have to understand why you're having to make a model, what type of information is held in the model, how you're transferring that information, what is the study about, how is it going to affect the design, how are you going to use that model, how are you going to document the model, how are you going to overlay it? And we still do situations, I knew in, in the first year studios I run, we have the students make really, really annoying models to make them make annoying models. And that's the purpose of it. And they're, they, 
bitch all the way through it, but it's a boot camp, and it we want them to struggle through that, and then and then it turns out that that's a really valuable like. Eight months later, we actually do these reviews with them and they give us feedback. And it turned out that was one of the most valuable moments for them in their education of that year is that when they went through that process of physically building this really annoying thing. But at other points, I wouldn't do that at all because my intentions are different. The, the knowledge transfer of what I'm trying to get them to look at, the type of information we want to deal with. But there, there's really, there's not an awful lot of room in this environment um, if you if you can't clearly articulate um, what you want them to look at, and that's I think that's a struggle for a lot of us because we've all come through educational systems and we've we've come through design disciplines, which are you know in some ways it's like well I don't know that until I make it. Yeah, okay, and at that point it'll be like if you make it, then it's how do you document it? How do you communicate it? How do you feed that back into the project? And so this is I mean these are the conversations we're still having and you know we're still we're still we have a culture of making at Lawrence Tech we have fab labs and digital printers and vacuum formers and and you know all that stuff is part of the school part of our part of our culture is making and so we also struggle with that culturally to how to engender that within this new within the environments that we're moving into I think one thing that within the studios have helped uh, is the lab. Uh, and I think, Carl, you, you were mentioning that kind of not being afraid of, I think, the lab mentality that it will be a trial and error, it will be experimentation, and even we can learn from the failures. Uh, I think in ID1, for example, I mean, this fall, we will be going into starting have a blended approach. I expect it to be hybrid. We'll be on campus. We are going to traditionally. So, it, Anubhav, yeah. let, let me yes. interject for just one second because we do mm -hmm. this. So, ID1 for us stands for Integrated awesome. Design One, which is the sophomore fall class, and it's based on site design. And then you also mentioned the lab. And so, for people that aren't aware, there's a small. If if the studio meets for what eight contact hours a week, mm -hmm. the lab is. Two hours? That is two hours. And so the lab is, in the way that Philip talked about things, a very explicit demonstration of something as it relates to the broader studio, right? You're coordinating yeah. the lab section. Yeah, I mean, different studios approach it in a different way. In some cases, it's tooling up and skill building. In some cases, it's very strategic, specific tutorials, demos, workshop. It's not really a project based. Uh, so in, in integrated design one or ID one, the sophomore site or land-based studio, the focus is really learning how to read landscape, uh, measure it, uh, draw contours, topo profiles, model it, and then manipulate, cut and fill, ramps, drainage, so on and so forth. Uh, I mean, when we were doing it on ground, there will be 60 students mayhem in, 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 on the site. Right, even we have worked with Egyptian A-frame and Groma, and so we have done analog, we have worked with digital, we're talking about doing with drones. Uh, but in online, if it's decentralized, we cannot meet on campus at all, that becomes a very different exercise. But that's where I think purpose, uh, not just the platform kick in. And we have talked about if it goes completely online and students, even we cannot meet with any student in a small group, uh, maybe we need to focus on uh, SketchUp, Rhino, and uh, digital modeling, looking into GIS, and teaching them contour uh, building and profile section in a digital way. And maybe they can build water levels and other things individually at home and measure out their backyard, learn uh, in terms of analog. So the collective experience is not analog anymore. The collective consistent experience become digital through the tools learning but they can still engage with the hands-on experience more at an individual capacity. Again, just based on situation and circumstance. So just in addition to Andrew's comment, in my case, the between on-ground session and online session, the, the bottom line was uh, pretty much the same. So everything has to be digitized and they submitted it through the Canvas, which is our course management system. So couple of actually quite many students, even though they are not able to uh, 
design and build a full scale model, they still sent me an email that I, can I still make some physical model? Cause it's part of our culture in architectural design studio and the billing system courses. So they actually make a small scale model, probably about this lab monitor size, and then they put it in their window and then they test it and then uh, digitize it, take a picture. And then this is how I done it physically. So students are actually, I was quite surprised that students are willing to do it. So as an instructor and faculty, our job is to provide a guidance how you can uh, submit it and then how we can uh, like uh, maximize the interaction between your teammates and between uh, you and us. So I think that's part of the very important job uh, as a faculty. I think we're almost at time. Were there any other key themes that came up in the in the chat that anybody wanted to bring forward? Or any last minute questions? Anurban's gonna say something. It might be as a continuation of the discussion about different expectations. There was one question about managing outcomes. Um, when some students are on ground, some students uh, are remote, they're engaging in a group work probably in a different way and uh, they have different value. How do we evaluate them? And uh, it might be slightly different in a graduate class like quick prax group work versus an undergraduate beginning studios. So I, th I think, so I thought that would be an important question to talk a little bit uh, and conversation about how we are addressing or can address it. With probably a lot of thought put into the curriculum on our bond in terms of the the outcomes that the faculty have decided different studios should be hitting and, and how we achieve those things, right? It's maybe how you define them to some extent, right? Is the is the outcome related to what that thing being physical or not? Um, but I also like Jason's point is that like everything has to get digitized at some point. And I think that's probably the world that we live in, that like, if it's not digitized, it, it, you can't share it, you can't collaborate with it, you can't print it, you can't render it, you can't do any of those things. And so there's probably some aspect of the, the digital being a kind of collector for us and a way to be able to share those things too. Um, but I know that the faculty have put a lot of thought into the trying to make the outcomes and the learning objectives and the definitions of each course as explicit as possible because we also have like like all schools a number of adjuncts that pop in and pop out and if we can't make those things clear to someone teaching the class how can we make them clear to a student that's in the class you guys are just nodding yes <laughs> uh, I think a number of people asked during the, through the chat session if this is being recorded. It, it was ACSA, I'm sure we'll be sharing the, the links to the stream. Um, and I, I'll speak for everybody on the panel. I, we'd love to continue this conversation. The more people, um, you know, there's a lot of very, very bad things that have come out of the pandemic, but I think the, um, we were talking, Philip and I were on a phone call with an industry exec recently who said that felt like 10 years of innovation occurred in the last three months. And so um, industries had to adapt, certainly higher education has had to adapt. And I think there's some really exciting things that are happening within design education as a result of these things. And so this is the moment to be discussing them. And um, I think we would all welcome more conversations about these things. So thank you very much to the panelists today. Thank you very much for all the attendees. And thanks to ACSA for hosting this. Hopefully it does create more discussion. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.